On this Friday night, telecom takeover approved. The mega merger between Shaw and Rogers. The politics, the conditions. We'll be watching them like a hawk. And the concerns over competition. Tragedy in the St. Lawrence River. The macabre discovery of migrants and the fears among area residents. Prosecuting a former U.S. president. What Donald Trump's indictment might mean for his other legal problems. Plus no longer being brushed off. We're trying very hard to get beyond a colonial attitude. Canada's expanding curation of Indigenous art. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. We begin with one of the biggest corporate takeovers in Canadian history that's set to reshape telecommunications in this country. The federal government has granted final approval of Rogers' multi-billion dollar acquisition of Shaw Communications. The $26 billion deal received the green light almost exactly two years to the day after it was first announced. But it comes with strict stipulations from the government designed to drive down cell phone costs and increase access to low-cost internet. Critics say that's still not enough, something we'll delve into in just a moment. But first, a breakdown of the deal itself and what it could mean for millions of Canadians. Our senior business correspondent Anne Gaviola begins our coverage tonight. I will ensure that a new fourth national player can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big three and actually drive down prices. A lofty pledge from the industry minister as he greenlights the $26 billion Rogers-Shaw merger with strings attached. 21 conditions to be exact, including that Rogers must establish a Western headquarters in Calgary and create 3,000 jobs in Western Canada that will remain for at least a decade. Rogers must invest $5.5 billion to expand 5G networks, the next generation of wireless, and a $1 billion to connect rural, Indigenous and remote communities. There are also requirements that wireless plans offered by Videotron be comparable to what's currently available in Quebec and offer options at least 20% cheaper than the major competition. Financial penalties for not meeting the conditions are up to $200 million for Videotron, up to a billion for Rogers. Many wonder how the conditions can be enforced when there's no telling who'll be running the country in the coming decade or what the telecom landscape may look like. The industry minister tells Global News the terms are in writing. It is a contract with the government, and it doesn't matter who's in office. Perhaps in the short term, there may be a honeymoon period where we don't see big changes with respect to pricing. But the suggestion that somehow this is a win for consumers, I think, runs counter to, frankly, what most consumers believe. It was basically a done deal from when they announced it. I don't like it. Less competition, higher prices for the consumers. The deal faced opposition from the Competition Bureau, consumer advocates and politicians, but ultimately it passed a series of legal and regulatory hurdles. More consolidation is likely if Canada's competition laws aren't changed. We should expect to find ourselves here again with, you know, maybe it's a different sector, maybe it's wireless again. There will be another mega merger. The Rogers-Shaw deal is important for fostering confidence in Canada's ability to get business deals done, according to the C.D. Howe Institute. A no from Ottawa would have created economic uncertainty. Every the company that makes investment in this uh, country is going to think twice about what the, uh, what the law means and how much they can count on uh, the law to protect their investment, protect their, protect their plan. Alberta's Shaw family controls both Shaw Communications and Chorus Entertainment, the parent company of Global News. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. When Rogers first proposed to acquire Shaw back in March of 2021, the deal got a thumbs down from every political party on Parliament Hill. Then the companies involved reworked the pitch and went back to the Trudeau government. The changes changed the mind of the Liberals and allowed the deal to proceed. But opposition parties still aren't sold on the transaction. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken has reaction for us from Ottawa tonight. David. Well, far the government may have changed its mind on the takeover of Shaw by Rogers, but the opposition remains steadfastly opposed. The leader of the opposition. Liberals love to suck up to big oligopolistic corporations that raise prices on consumers and make life less affordable. They the Conservatives slammed the, the decision to let Rogers buy Shaw. Today, they announced that they think that there's too much competition in the wireless and in the internet business, and they've allowed for a massive merger. The 
the and the NDP were Canadians. just as harsh. This is a disaster that will end with less competition, massive layoffs, and higher prices. Why have the Liberals thrown in the towel, side of the telco CEOs, and are sticking Canadian families with higher prices and the bell? But the government believes that a strong fourth national wireless player, that would be Freedom Mobile under new owner Videotron, will actually lower prices. The Canadians have told us one thing, bring prices down, more competition. And the way to do that in Canada is to have a fourth national player, Madam Speaker. That's why we impose conditions, because we want lower prices for Canadians and we'll be watching them like a hawk. The partisan back and forth aside, the massive telco deal has highlighted the need for some broader policy reforms to better regulate mergers and encourage competition and be able to do it more efficiently. Competition law professor Jennifer Quaid told the industry committee as much. I actually would make a plea for a bigger picture approach to maybe think about how can we build a system that isn't siloed where regulators can consult each other and work together and we're not stepping on each other's toes. As for the telecom sector, all parties on the Commons Industry Committee already unanimously recommended structural changes to the telecommunications industry. And the industry minister says if Rogers and Videotron are not meeting the government's objectives, well, that might be something he will consider. If we don't see meaningful reduction, I'm in the House of Parliament this morning. I'll be seeking additional power to make sure that we drive down prices. And at that time, everything is on the as everything is on the table. In the meantime, the government has frozen all transfers of any telecom licenses, giving itself some time to assess the fallout from this mega deal. Farah. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thank you, David. Now to the disturbing discovery and recovery mission in the water around Aquasasne, Quebec, where divers searching a section of the St. Lawrence River found two more bodies following a boat capsizing yesterday near the U.S. border. The bodies of eight people, including two children who both hold Canadian passports, have been pulled from the river. Early signs suggest it's the tragic reality of human smuggling. Police say they are still searching for the 30-year-old owner of the small vessel. Aquasasne is a Mohawk territory and it lies in the middle of the St. Lawrence, straddling parts of Quebec, Ontario and New York State. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says it's a heartbreaking situation. Those who drowned are believed to be from two migrant families from India and Romania. It's believed they were trying to cross into the U.S. illegally from Canada. Braden Jagger Haynes reports. What started as an initial search for one missing person turned into a horrific discovery. The bodies of migrants of Indian and Romanian descent were pulled from the frigid marshy waters of the St. Lawrence River near Aquasasne, Quebec. Two Canadian-born children were among the dead. Police believe the families were trying to enter the United States illegally. Authorities located the bodies while searching for a 30-year-old Casey Oakes, a local who was reported missing and was last seen in a small boat Wednesday night. A vessel matching the description as being operated by Casey Oakes was also located near the location of the deceased persons. The territory straddles Quebec, Ontario and New York State and is known as a transit point for smuggling. It's always at night they get dropped off at the shoreline and they're believing that it's um, the USA. Residents say illegal activity has increased in frequency but fear the repercussions if they speak out. Quiet about it, we don't say nothing because we might get um, shot or burnt out or you know our house burnt down so it's you got to be quiet since january there have been 48 incidents of people trying to cross illegally through the territory uh, we're a very small police service mm -hmm. um, but we're trying our best to increase the the security and the surveillance of the community the federal government is watching the situation closely. This is a heartbreaking situation. Obviously, there are many questions that need answered, but we're not going to uh, respond to the various speculation going on right now. We're going to continue to approach this with the seriousness uh, and the thoughtfulness that it requires. In the meantime, autopsies are being conducted along with toxicology tests to determine the cause of deaths. Police are attempting to identify the victims and determine their status in Canada. Braid and Jagger Haynes, Global News, Aquasasne, Quebec. To the U.S. now, where a man who once held the most powerful office in the world is days away from having his mugshot and fingerprints taken. 
Former President Donald Trump was indicted by a grand jury in New York late Thursday over a criminal case that centered on hush money paid to an adult film star during his 2016 campaign. Now he's expected to surrender himself to police. Our Jackson Prosco joins us now with more on the latest fallout and, of course, the political reaction that comes with this decision. Jackson. Well, Farah, in many places, this is seen as a test of whether or not a former president is above the law. But tonight, Donald Trump is claiming political persecution, and he's trying to rile up his supporters in his defense. It's a stress test for American democracy and a stunning fall for a former president. Donald Trump's arraignment will take place inside this Manhattan courthouse next week after he surrenders and is fingerprinted and photographed. A first for any former or current president, but the same treatment as any other criminal defendant. This is one of the first times in his life when he has to play by the rules that everyone else plays by. Late Thursday, Trump was informed of the New York grand jury's decision to indict him. Despite all the scuttlebutt and rumors and whatnot, we believed and hoped that rule of law would have prevailed, so he initially was, was shocked. Reports suggest he faces 30 or more charges relating to allegations of business fraud and a hush money scheme involving payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The specific charges remain under seal. That hasn't stopped the frenzied claims from Trump's backers. I think the unprecedented indictment of a former president of the United States for a campaign finance issue is an outrage. Outside Mar-a-Lago, Trump supporters rallied defiantly. Actually, I think it's helping him. I think he's going to get more votes now because people maybe will wake up. But it's in New York where concern remains about security. Trump has repeatedly called for protests and warned of violence, claiming to be the target of political persecution. In my case, every piece of my personal life, financial life, business life and public life has been turned upside down and dissected like no one in the history of our country. What happens next could define the 2024 presidential campaign, where Trump is still a candidate. I'm not going to talk about something like this. New York could be just the start of Trump's legal troubles. He still faces multiple probes in far more serious cases involving election interference, classified documents, and the storming of the U.S. Capitol. The charges here may open Pandora's box in terms of the other prosecutions that he's facing around the nation. So, Jackson, could Trump face prison time? And what do these charges mean for his presidential campaign? Well, when it comes to the campaign, it's full steam ahead. In fact, within minutes of the indictment being revealed last night, Trump was attempting to fundraise off his own looming criminal trial. As for the question of jail, we won't really know more about that until the indictments are unsealed, because, of course, that will reveal the specific charges that he's facing. It is possible that some of them could include jail time if he were convicted, but a trial ultimately is a year or more away. And at the end of the day, it's the other court cases that Trump faced that could pose far more legal jeopardy and potentially jail time for him if he's convicted in those matters. Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thank you, Jackson. Former Liberal MP Han Dong has served a libel notice against Global News and our parent company, Chorus Entertainment. The move follows Global News reporting that two independent national security sources said Dong had a conversation in 2021 with the Chinese Consul General in which Dong raised the cases of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor and allegedly advised China to delay their release. Dong denies these allegations. A letter from Dong's lawyer calls the reporting defamatory. He's seeking an apology and a retraction. Membership application approved. Coming up, how soon Finland could join NATO? Plus, what the president of Belarus is pushing for in Ukraine. Finland has overcome its last hurdle to join NATO. Nearly a year after seeking the security of the alliance following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Turkey's parliament officially ratified Finland's bid on Thursday. Turkey was the last holdout among 30 member nations that all must agree on any new member. NATO's secretary general says Finland will formally join its military alliance in the coming days. A similar bid by Sweden is still in progress, but it's stalled over diplomatic grievances with Turkey and Hungary. The president of Belarus is calling for a ceasefire in Ukraine without conditions. Russia says a ceasefire would not achieve the goals of its so-called special military operation. 
In his annual address, Alexander Lukashenko also called for Moscow and Kyiv to start talks on a peace deal. Russia says Ukraine needs to accept losing territory. Ukraine says Russia must withdraw its troops as a precursor to any agreement. Lukashenko also defended the storage of Russian tactical nuclear weapons in his country and says Russia could place powerful strategic nuclear weapons there too. He says they're needed to protect sovereignty through any means necessary. Ahead, the struggle to meet mental health needs in Nova Scotia after the worst mass shooting in Canadian history. One of the most powerful messages from Nova Scotia's Mass Casualty Commission is a warning about mental health. The final report into Canada's worst mass shooting was released on Thursday. The commissioners say even three years later, there is a public health emergency. Mike Armstrong explains. It is a community still reeling from what it went through. There is the loss, 22 people. Friends and family were deeply affected. And then there are people like Janet Ackerman, who followed the news and hid in her home. She lives just a few kilometers from where the whole thing started. The gunman's home was on this property. While he was on the loose, Ackerman hid. I was locked up in, in, in my bedroom and I just stayed there. So that's what I did. The whole day? The whole day. It was in a way a trauma on top of a trauma. The mass shooting took place in the first weeks of the pandemic. Across the country, psychologists were already busy. The Mass Casualty Commission's final report says the mental health needs of the communities most affected were never met. There is still, to this day, it says, a public health emergency. Families are not receiving the mental health support that they need. The local MP says after the tragedy, governments never stepped up. He says people have been paying for mental health services out of their own pockets, that there's been no compensation. That is something the commission says should be addressed. It calls for the governments of Canada and Nova Scotia to, quote, jointly fund a program to address the public health emergency in the local communities and that it should be done soon, by May 1st of this year. Both the Prime Minister and the Premier were at the report's release, neither committed to anything, saying they need time to study it. 3,000 pages, uh, for sure, there's, there's a lot. The report also says there is a mental health problem for first responders. It says many are still affected by what they lived through and getting help to them isn't easy. They, in fact, tend to downplay their need for support. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Portapic, Nova Scotia. Curating Indigenous art, next, including artists in the push to create inclusive and equitable galleries. Indigenous peoples have created some of the most recognizable and prized pieces of art in Canada. But for generations, they haven't always been part of the decision-making process about how art is selected and presented in galleries and museums. And that's starting to change. This week on The New Reality, Donna Friesen looks at how Indigenous voices are now leading the conversation about art in this country. The National Gallery in Ottawa is home to the largest collection of art created in Canada. And yet it might surprise you, the gallery only added its first piece of contemporary Indigenous art in the mid-1980s, an indication perhaps of how much the art world viewed the significance of Indigenous works. Institutions don't change themselves. People change institutions. Over the last year, the gallery has been rethinking its approach, launching the Department of Indigenous Ways and Decolonization. For the first time in this institution's 80-year history, you have not one, but two Indigenous people at the highest level of decision-making, at our executive management level. So when you start bringing in those lived perspectives, that starts to change things from the inside. This is a beautiful piece. That means embedding Indigenous voices and expertise in all aspects of the National Gallery. There's an Indigenous art history of this land, there's Indigenous art histories from other lands. We're starting to understand the plurality of cultural expression and getting away from this notion of a dominance of one kind. But the new department hasn't come without opposition. Faced with the reality that change can be threatening and not everyone is open to it. You're always going to get that pushback because it's about power and privilege and institutions like this are built on power and privilege. But that can't deter us from what we're doing. The Winnipeg Art Gallery has taken a new approach, launching a one-of-its-kind center for Inuit art and culture. 
This is Kalmayuk. It's in the heart of Winnipeg, not in Inuit territory, but everything about it was designed in consultation with Inuit knowledge keepers and elders. It's designed to be a bridge between the north and the south. We're trying very hard to get beyond a colonial attitude towards art, uh, just opening up being transparent, bringing people into the process, and not just saying, well, this is the way we do it and that's, that's that. Kamayoku is so important on so many levels. Glenn Gear, a multidisciplinary artist of mixed Inuit background, was commissioned to create an installation for Kamayoku's opening in 2021. Having the, the gallery featuring Inuit work from across the Inuit and, uh, got, and showing that diversity of voices is something that has longevity. It's something that I feel really connected to. Kamayuk is the largest public collection of contemporary Inuit art in the world, showcasing pieces spanning generations while fostering relationships with artists and their communities. 30 years ago, we didn't have the, the language to really think about what decolonizing a space would mean. And uh, I think now there's a lot more dialogue with Indigenous, non-Indigenous folks that challenge sort of those, those hierarchies. Institutions like this can be gathering places and for the past and the present and the future to intersect. And I think that's what art and culture does and can do and must do. And we have to be the facilitators of that kind of change. Claiming a rightful place in the present and creating inclusive, equitable galleries for the future. Donna Friesen, Global News. And for an inside look at that largest public collection of Inuit art and to learn more about the state of the system of art in Canada, watch the new reality right here on Global, Saturday at 7 p.m. And that's Global National for this Friday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and your Canada tonight is Kamloops, British Columbia. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night. <laughs>